All right, everybody, it is six o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Rachel Felling. I'm a naturalist for the Zionsville Parks and Recreation Department, and I appreciate y'all joining me for our Backyard Maple Sugaring webinar. Uh, this is our second year doing this as a webinar, but I've been running this program or some version of it for four or five years now through the Zionsville Parks Department, so it's a really fun program. Um, so just a couple quick housekeeping notes before we dive in. Um, for those of you who are watching live, I am recording this. Um, I started everybody with your cameras and your mics off, but I just want you to be aware that it is being recorded and it is gonna be posted on our town social media accounts. Um, I'm gonna give people a chance to ask questions at the end. If you do choose to you know, unmute or turn on your camera, feel free or ask your questions in the chat. Um, and if you have questions in the chat, throw them up at any time and I will do my best to keep an eye on the chat um, and answer them as we go. I've got a lot of info. You are gonna get the link to this afterwards. So if there's anything you miss, you'll have the link to the video at, you know, by tomorrow and you will be able to go back and find any of the information. Um, you also can just email me. I emailed all of you the link to the Zoom recording, so feel free to shoot an email. Um, we will try to finish right around seven o'clock. Um, there's a pretty important IU Purdue basketball game tonight for anybody else who might wanna watch. And uh, I'm a Hoosier and I married a boiler maker, so it's a tense night in our house. Um, so anyways, without any further ado, let's talk about backyard maple sugaring. So why do I care about this? Well, I first learned about how to make maple syrup um, you know, a lot of years ago now when my first job out of college, I was working as a naturalist at a nature center in Maryland. Um, and every uh, February, we had a maple sugaring season there where we tapped trees on the property, we made maple syrup, we brought kids out on field trips and taught them the whole process. And that's where I really learned about it for the first time. Prior to that, I had no idea that your Aunt Jemima log cabin type syrup, grocery store syrup, wasn't real maple syrup. I had no idea. I did not grow up in a house where we bought the expensive stuff or had family that made it. I know plenty of people did. Um, so it wasn't until then. And so I did it through work for years and years. And then when uh, we moved to Indiana and we were looking for a place to live, my husband and I looked at the house that we ended up buying and it's uh, a wooded property and it was full of maple trees. And I said to him while we were looking at the house for the very first time, we could make maple syrup if we lived here. And I, he kind of like laughed about it, like, okay. Um, and you know, here we are five years later, a lot of money sunken into this hobby slash job. Um, and we've turned it into our own little sort of hobby small business. Um, I run a little tiny business called uh, Two Acre Woods Maple Syrup. I started selling it just sort of out of my home initially to people I knew. Um, and you can now find our syrup throughout the winter months. They usually sell out pretty quickly, but at uh, Wonder Tree Farm here in Zionsville. So uh, we're just getting into the season. So I assume everybody in this webinar is interested in learning about this because you're thinking, maybe this is something I could do. It could be fun. And it absolutely is fun. I love maple sugaring for a lot of reasons. One being that like, it's always just cool to have something homemade, but two, because I don't know about you all, but this time of year at January end of winter, I start just feeling down and maple sugaring comes at just that time of year where the winter is really starting to wear on you, but spring is on the horizon. And to me, it just gives this like bright spot at the end of winter to tide you over until spring. It's almost like a bridge between winter and spring to me. So that's just like my own like little seasonal depression reason that I love maple sugaring because it comes at just the right time of year for me. Um, that said, it's a lot of work. So let's dive into it. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to put on. So I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to pop out of it at a few points to sort of show you some of my supplies. Um, I've done maple sugaring in a few different ways over the years, um, trial and error to figure out what works best for me. So again, at any point, ask those questions in the chat and I will do my very best to answer them. And then we'll just open it up to full on questions at the end. So let me get my PowerPoint up here. 
All right. So hopefully you guys can all see that. There we go. All right. So um, like I said, Two Acre Woods, that is my little side business. Um, and again, also naturalist for Zionsville Parks and Recreation Department. That is the day job. Definitely maple sugaring is not uh, what pays the bills. Promise you that. Um, so maple sugaring, just a brief history. How did people figure this out? How long has it been done? And the, the history of it is actually really interesting. Maple sugaring is this uniquely North American thing. Um, so for hundreds and hundreds of years, Native Americans were making maple syrup long before anybody from anywhere else showed up um, in North America. And there's some different legends um, about how they may have discovered that sap can be turned into syrup and can be eaten. Um, and I won't go into the different legends, but there's some fun ones out there. In all likelihood, they probably observed some of the animals that were going to maple trees in the winter. So for one, squirrels will often go to the buds on maple trees because you can, there are buds on the trees right now and they would eat the buds off of them. They still do this. Um, and they do this on maple trees, but not other trees because the sweet sap that is in there. In all likelihood though, it was probably this woodpecker you see on the top left of the screen, the yellow bellied sap sucker. So the yellow belly sap sucker is a really interesting bird. Um, Woodpeckers make holes, we know that, but if you see the holes in those straight little lines like that, small circle holes in a line, it is the yellow-bellied sapsucker. There are some other varieties of sapsuckers out there, but this is the only one we have here in Indiana. So they will drill these little holes, and most woodpeckers are drilling holes just to get the bugs out of the trees. The sapsucker will actually drink the sap, and then they will also wait for ants and other bugs that may be around to come by and be attracted to the sweet sap and then they will eat it too. So is that how the, the Native Americans first figured this out? Maybe, maybe not. Um, <clears throat> but then once uh, the Native Americans realized they could collect sap from trees um, and they did drill holes in trees and use spiles out of um, things like hollowed out sumac and other hollowed out woods, they went through a very labor intensive process of boiling a town um, where they hollowed out trees or logs and then put hot rocks in over and over again. Took the rocks out as they cooled, put in new hot rocks to heat the sap and boil it down, which I just, knowing how hard it is to boil down sap with more modern equipment, I cannot imagine doing it that way. Um, then, you know, as we go forward into history and we have things like iron pots and pans brought along makes the process a little bit easier, um, but still painstaking. But again, it was, it's something that, um, you know, late winter food stores are, are low, being able to make maple syrup, it's this high sugar content thing, it's a special treat. Um, there's a lot of good stuff that you can get from that. There's a lot of good reasons why it's great to do it. Um, and then as time went on, um, you know, it's supplemental income for, um, for farmers in the winter. So it was, a very, very, very labor intensive process. Historically, it's still pretty labor intensive, but the technology has come a long way. So how it's done now looks very, very, very different. Um, so this picture on the left is a commercial evaporator in a large scale, large scale production. Um, these things can be, you know, hundreds of feet long, they're massive, they're boiling literally thousands of gallons of sap at a time. Um, the big maple syrup producers are using these wide tubes that are running through the woods and that pump, they're on these vacuum pumps that pump the sap out of the trees to like central collection points. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever seen this. It's a really cool thing to see, kind of weird looking in my opinion. Um, and there are producers even here in Indiana who do it at this scale. Not as many of them as if you go to New England or Canada, but it's around here. It's really interesting. It's pretty labor intensive to set up. And then there's always the chances for um, if you get a leak somewhere in your line and then trying to find that and fix it. I am not anywhere near that level of production, but it is out there. Um, and then canning and bottling on large scale as well. So that is not what we're here to do. We're here to learn about how do I do this in my backyard with some minimal supplies. 
So before we get into that, let's talk about when and where we make maple syrup. So this image that you see on the screen is the, um, <clears throat> the native range of sugar maples. Acer saccharum is the scientific name for the sugar maple tree. So, you know, a lot of us probably when we think maple syrup, we think New England, Canada, and yeah, definitely, that is definitely in the range, but Indiana is well within it too. In fact, um, a couple hundred years ago, Indiana, even, you know, a little more than 100 years ago, Indiana was one of the top producing states for maple syrup in the entire country. Um, the reason our numbers have gone down and New England has hung up there is because a lot of our forest areas where maple syrup was being produced has been cut down for farmland because we have good soil for farmland here, whereas the hills of New England are less amenable to large scale farming like we think of here for corn, wheat, soybeans, things like that. Um, so those rocky hills in New England, you know, they don't, they're not as easily uh, transferred into farmland. So anyways, that's part of the reason it has declined in Indiana, but we still have a pretty awesome uh, maple sugar making population here. Um, so when do we make maple syrup? We make it in the very late winter, very early spring, and really what it is is the temperatures. That's the thing you want to look for the most. And I apologize if anybody here is squeaking. My dog is playing with a squeak toy in the other room. Um, so we're looking for temperatures that get above freezing during the day and below freezing at night. So for those of us here in central Indiana, that's usually right around uh, end of January, sometimes we get there, beginning of February through the end of February or early March. It varies a little bit season by season. Um, if you're watching this in Kentucky or Tennessee, your season's probably already well started. For people up in New England, they're not even thinking about starting yet. So um, we're, we're right there. We're right at about the right time. There are people in central Indiana who I know have already tapped some trees. I have not yet. I usually wait until the end of a really big cold snap, which is what we're in right now. For me, looking ahead at the 10 day forecast, I'm thinking the very last weekend of January or that next week, first week of February is when I'm tapping. I have tapped this early before though. So it's just season by season, you know, watching the weather, being ready and knowing when to do it. Um, and then your season lasts until the buds open on the trees. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute when we talk about tree selection, but what's happening with the trees and the reason we do this this time of year is the trees are getting ready for spring. It might not look like the trees are doing much right now when it's this cold, but they are getting ready for spring. So when you get that above freezing during the day, um, below freezing at night, you get this pressure change that happens with the sap. So the sap inside the tree is sending that sugar up from, from the bottom towards the tips, to those buds to help produce the leaves and flowers that are about to come out in, um, in early spring. So once those buds open, the sugar content in the sap drops off and you're not gonna get nearly as much sap and the sap that does come is going to not have as much sugar in it, not gonna be as sweet. So it's really that very fine time of year, usually lasts about a month, every once in a while, only lasts a couple of weeks. You just never really know. Um, and as you can imagine, and I won't get into this too much, there are implications with um, climate change um, <laughs> affecting maple sugaring ranges as well. Um, so, all right, let's jump to the next one. All right, so if you want to make maple syrup, what do you need? All right, what supplies do you have to have if you're gonna make your own maple syrup? So there is some initial cost you're gonna have. There are a few things that you're going to have to buy. You can definitely do a very minimal makeshift version of this, um, but you will have to make a little bit of investment. And then it's, it's, I will tell you, it's one of those hobbies that once you get into it, you're gonna spend more money, okay? I, I think it's kind of like beekeeping to me or something like that, you know, where you start and you might start just with these little small things and then you're going to add more and more and more. And then suddenly you're like, uh oh, this has gotten out of hand. But, you know, I just 
give that disclaimer before you start. So minimally, you need a drill bit because you're going to have to drill a hole in the tree. We'll talk where to place the hole and how to decide and all that in a minute. But minimally, you need a drill bit. Um, and then type of drill bit you will need, whether it's 5 16 or 7 16 which is what you see there, is going to depend on the spile that you're going to use. So um, here is my drill bit. They make specialized ones um, for um, maple sugaring. Do you have to have that? Not necessarily. Have I broken drill, drill bits in trees that were not made for this? Yes, I have. So one-time purchase just for your, your tree drill bit, um, you can do it. So there's two different size spiles that are generally on the market. Now, what is a spile? Let's back that up and talk about it. A spile is the thing that you're going to stick into the tree. Um, I'm gonna jump out of the screen share for a minute here to show you some spiles, okay? So a spile, think of it almost like a straw, right? Or some people will call it a tap, but spile is the actual name. It is what, so I've drilled my hole in the tree. Now I need something to stick in it like a little spout. So um, hundreds of years ago, the Native Americans used hollowed out sumac branches as their preferred spiles. This is a metal spile. And this is the larger one. So this is a 7 16 This is a smaller one. This is 5 16 Both of these are made with metal. Um, and then you have your plastic varieties, okay? So what you choose to get in terms of your spiles is totally up to you. How much you're gonna use, what's your budget, what kind of aesthetic, do you care how it looks, how it doesn't look, okay? And these lead into the next thing is, how are you collecting your sap? What is this dripping into? So let's just start with this one to give you sort of an image. So imagine that this is in the tree, you're going to hammer it into the hole and it'll sit there. Um, you hammer it in gently and it gets stuck in there and it's gonna sit there and we are not hurting the tree. I should back up and say that we'll talk about picking the right tree in a minute, but we're not hurting the tree if we do this appropriately. And then you are going to have something for the sap to go into. So for a spile like this, you would hammer it in with this little hook on it. And then the hook hooks onto this beautiful metal bucket. These buckets, then we all have a lid of some sort. That's what this is right here. Okay, it sits on it. I'm not gonna make a lot of noise and shove it on there right now. And then it sits on your tree. The metal buckets are gorgeous. They look so picturesque hanging on your trees on the side of your driveway or on the big, beautiful maple tree in your front yard. They are not the most practical. They are also the most expensive. So I have like six buckets that I put out and I put them on the trees that are along my driveway because I think they're pretty. Um, but would I invest in 20 or 30 or 50 buckets like that? Absolutely not. They're smaller, they hold less sap than some of these other methods that we're gonna talk about in just a moment um they fall off easier and they're more expensive so you know depends on what you're going for okay some of the other options that i definitely use um i prefer these little taps um, or little spiles and this one works with these bags so you may have seen these blue bags i don't know why they're always blue um but you buy a holder that looks like this, and there's actually two parts. The bag slides on with this other metal part, and it sits in there, and it fills with sap. And this thing can hold about twice as much as the bucket I just showed you. And then the, it sits on this little, you can see the little like shark fin hook on the top of this. So it's just like this, but it'll sit flat on the tree, okay? And it drips into that bag. So that's another method. I really like those. I think it's a great starter option. Um, you will have to buy that through a maple syrup specialized dealer. And I'm going to give you some resources to check for these things at the end. Another option are plastic. Okay. Now, with when you're talking about plastic and food, it's always really important to go for food grade plastic. So these spiles are designed for this. They will be food grade. But what you use these with, is then, let's knock everything over, is this plastic tubing, okay? And the tubing comes in a big roll and then you cut it to size. 
So then this goes in the tree, tap, tap, tap in the tree. And this is the same tubing that if you were one of those big producers that have got all your tubes connected on a vacuum pump and pumping to a central location, you'd use the same sort of stuff. But what I do instead, and this is how I've shifted over the years because it is easier to be completely honest, is I tap this into the tree, okay? And then the tube goes straight down and then I buy a food grade five gallon bucket. You can find these at Lowe's, Home Depot. Um, maybe don't go to the Lowe's right here in Zionsville because I usually buy them all. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I have plenty now, but I have bought them all two years in a row. Um, and you drill a hole in the lid, small hole, just a teeny bit smaller than what this tube is because you want to don't want to add more rainwater if you can help it. And it just goes straight down. Okay. And so this is actually a pretty cheap, cost-effective way to do it. The five gallon buckets are great because they can hold a heck of a lot of sap before you need to carry them, but carrying them is a pain. Um, and that's, that's an option for how you can do it. I have seen people take empty milk jugs and stick them on a spile. Um, I've seen people do things like that or um, the big um, water jugs, like you'd have out a water station in the office. Those, if you can get your hands on some of those, those work really, really well with the plastic tubing. Um, so lots of different options for your spiles and then your bag bucket collection method. But those are your initial investments, okay? The metal buckets, you can use over and over again. The plastic bags, I know some people do reuse them. To be honest, usually by the end of the season, they're in beat up enough that I don't try to reuse them. I just buy new plastic bags every year, which is not the most eco-conscious. The tubing, I sometimes reuse. Yes and no. The spiles can all be reused. They all, everything's gotta be really well cleaned at the end of the season and at the start of the season, um, but there are some options there. Okay, so again, if you have questions, pop them in the chat. Um, I'm gonna jump back into my screen share here. All right, let's talk about what else I need. So we've got our bag, or we've got our drill bit, we've drilled our holes, we've put in our spiles. You've decided if you're gonna hang a, a bucket, a bag, you're gonna just stick an old milk jug on there or something like that and figure it out. Um, now, where are you gonna put your sap? Because, and as we'll go into later in just a moment, you're gonna get a lot of sap from your trees, okay? So make sure you have somewhere to put it. Again, food grade plastic. Don't go by the blue Lowe's buckets from the side of the aisle. Find a bucket that says food grade plastic because the problem otherwise is that there could be chemicals that leach out of plastic when you store liquid in them that you don't wanna be consuming once you boil it down. So glass works well. Um, growlers from um, like breweries are awesome if you've got some of those on hand. I mean, the first year we did this, I got like the big water jugs that you would use at sporting events. I borrowed every container that I could from my in-laws, all of their water coolers, thermoses, everything to store the sap until I could boil it all down because you're going to have a lot to store and you need a place to store it that's gonna stay relatively cool, okay? So keep that in mind as well. Um, a, an evaporator or a place to cook it. We're gonna talk more about that in a minute. So just hold on to your questions about that because that's always like a, the spot where people are like, I don't know what I'm going to do or how I'm going to do it. You're going to need a candy thermometer or a hydrometer. I prefer a hydrometer, but if you're just starting and you've got a candy thermometer in your drawer, you use that. Pretty cheap and easy to find. Hydrometer, you're going to have to order probably from the internet or go to a specialized place. Um, I know that if you brewed beer or um, homemade wine, you use hydrometers. I just don't know if they have the same scale because um, I've never done either of those things. That is what you need for maple syrup. So we'll talk about that. Um, you can, uh, somebody asked, do you have to store the sap or can you boil it every day? You can, but it's going to take a while. So um, you can, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about boiling in a second. Um, and then a filter. I'll talk to you about the filters in a second there. I do highly recommend buying, spending a little bit of money on a specialized one and then something to put it in once it's done to store it when you have your final syrup. Um, you can buy bottles. I put all my syrup that I make in these bottles. Um, they cost a little bit more than a mason jar, but they're very pretty. I'm selling my syrup. So I need to try to package it nicely, but there's no reason you can't use, you know, mason jars, things like that. Just keep them clean. Um, all right. So 
let's jump into tree selection, okay? Because that's also the place where everybody always has questions. So tree ID and tap placement. I'm not gonna go deep into winter tree ID. That, that could be its own whole class. Um, if you have no idea yet right now, whether or not you have maple trees or not, this may not be the year for you to get started. Um, but what you're looking for, maple trees have opposite branching. So meaning if there's a branch here, there's a branch symmetrical from it. Um, you can see that in this picture in the lower left. Um, there's generally a few different types of maple trees in our area. Sugar maples are our highly desired tree for maple, making maple syrup, but you can tap any kind of maple you want. Japanese maples, I don't think work so well, um, but they also don't get very big, so they probably would be out. Um, but red maples, silver maples, um, even Norway maples, though there's some debate on that. Um, so, but the reason we like the sugar maples best is because they have the highest sugar content, okay? Their sugar content is 40 to one, meaning for 40 gallons of sap, you are going to get one gallon of maple syrup, okay? So that gives you an idea of just how much work is gonna go into this. You're gonna take 40 gallons of sap and boil it down to make just one gallon of maple syrup. So if you've got sugar maples in your yard, great. If you're like a lot of people in Zionsville, you probably have some silver maples. There are a lot of silver maples around Zionsville and around central Indiana in general. I primarily have silver maples in my yard. I've got a few sugars, but a lot of silvers. Um, if you live in a wet area, you probably have red maples. Um, black maples are also out there. Um, the other maples are about 60 to 80 to one. So you're just gonna have to do more work if you make, make it from these other ones. Taste-wise, it'll be the same. It's just how much work are you gonna do to get there? So how many trees do I tap? How much sap should I expect? Generally, you're looking at 10 to 20 gallons of sap coming out of your tree in a season, okay? 10 to 20 gallons of sap, not syrup, but sap. So remember, if we're talking 40 to one, that means at best, if you just have one tree that you're putting one tap in, you might get enough to make a half gallon of syrup, okay? Um, you know, just depends on how much you're looking for. Maybe a couple taps is all you need to get what you want, or maybe you wanna tap five trees or have five different taps, it just depends. I tap somewhere between 50 and 60 every year at my house. Um, so the, in that 10 to 20 range, there's a lot of factors that can play into that. If you have a maple tree that's sitting in your front yard, that's by itself, not shaded by anything else, gets tons of sun, it's going to be more towards the 20. Your smaller trees that are back in the woods have more shade on them, probably going to be more towards the 10. So just kind of depends on tree placement is a big factor. And then health of the tree, some other things like that um, could go into it. The rainfall that it's had, all these things can affect it. But somewhere between 15 is usually the number of people get of how many gallons of sap to expect. All right, so you let's say you've established which trees you like. Um, let's talk about tapping them. So to be able to do this without hurting the tree, your tree needs to be um, at least 10 inches of diameter. The analogy that is always given is it's like donating blood. And I actually think the analogy holds up pretty well. So just like a healthy adult can donate blood every once in a while without having any real ill effects, you can take sap from a healthy adult tree without any real effects. It will still grow as it should. It will still um, open up all of its buds. They overproduce on sap. That is what the maple trees do. And we can harvest some of it without hurting them. So make sure you're at least, your tree is at least 10 inches in diameter. Um, I learned 12 inches in, initially when I was first learning. And so that's what I always go with. Um, avoid trees that look like they have any kind of disease issues or anything like that. Like if they've got a big black spot somewhere or some new holes or things like that that you haven't noticed, don't tap those. It's got big recent breaks on it. Try to avoid that. That's a tree that's healing, right? It's like a person that just had surgery, right? That person does not get to go donate blood. That tree, you should give it a break. 
okay? Um, you want to find a spot on the tree that's going to get some good afternoon sun. That's going to be your best area for production. So think sunlight more than anything. Um, and then if you can go under a large branch, because that is where the tree is sending the sap up. Okay. That's where you want to put your tap. We, I usually recommend about like waist high. You don't want to be reaching up here. You don't want it to be down on the ground, but just sort of waist high is where you want to put your tap. Um, and then you can tap the same tree year after year. And you can even put multiple taps in a tree. If your tree, if you've got one of those massive maple trees that's, you know, two feet wide, for every 10 to 12 inches in diameter, you could add another tap. Um, I've never seen anybody put more than like three in, but I know people have. Um, it just depends. If, if you have a really huge tree, you can potentially put more taps and just spread them out. Um, <clears throat> and if you tap the same tree year after year, move the tap location slightly. So the best practice is to move it at least two inches over and at least two inches up or down. So if I have it here this year, I'm going to move it up here this year, and then I'm going to move it down here and then up here. And you end up making like a zigzag pattern around the tree. Um, and you should be able to see the scar from the previous year when you go to tap. Occasionally, depending on the type of tree, it can be a little tough. It's pretty easy on sugar maples. Silver maples have kind of a, um, a more um, peely bark that makes it slightly more difficult. So just keep that in mind. Um, so once you've found your good spot, oh, you're like, I know this tree is 12 inches. It looks healthy. I've got a spot that's gonna get afternoon sun. I'm under a large branch, waist high, get your drill, find your drill bits. Um, and then you're gonna drill in. You wanna go in one to two inches, okay? So one to two inches, not very far, okay? And then pull out, that's the other nice thing about the, the maple drill bits is that they're sized just right for how far in you should drill. Um, pull out the drill. Um, you can kind of clean off any wood shavings that you see there. I usually try to have a nice clean something to stick in it and pull out any wood shavings. And then gently with a mallet is what you're supposed to use or just a hammer, gently tap in your tap. And what I always tell people to listen for, and this is like one of those learned things over time, sometimes people think they need to like go, go, go really deep in. That was a mistake I made early. You can actually go past the point where the sap is flowing um, is you want it to sound hollow. Like when you tap on the tree, literally with your hammer, it'll sound like you're hitting into something hollow. And when it changes to sounding like something solid, you've probably gone too far. So pull it back up a little bit. And it should sit in there pretty snug. Every once in a while, for whatever reason, you may have to redo a tap hole, not the end of the world, um, but it should, your tap should sit in there pretty snug, okay? Then hang your bucket, bag, whatever you're doing in place. And usually if you're doing this on one of those first days where, oh, now it's 38, 40 degrees and the sun's out, you'll see the sap immediately starting to trickle out, immediately. It's an instant gratification and it'll start collecting. And even if it's just drip, 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 that adds up pretty quickly. All right, so then think about when we talked about storing your sap, you're gonna have to go out and collect that sap because you're going to fill those buckets and bags potentially every single day. Again, remember how I said I liked to use the tubing into a five gallon bucket? Part of that is why I have never filled a five gallon bucket in a day. These buckets will overflow in a day, on a good day. Not every day, but on a good production day. I've had these bags nearly overflow. They, they look like big fat bladders um, when they're totally full of sap. Um, but a five gallon bucket has, it's gotten close to overflowing, but never fully overflowed on me. Um, and then have a spot to put it, keep it cool. It can spoil. So maybe a garage, if you don't have, if your garage is not insulated um, in the shade somewhere in New England where they get a lot of snow, they'll literally make like snow piles and pack their stuff into it. Um, this is again, where extra five gallon food grade buckets, those big water jugs um, come in handy. Um, somebody asked how much can the blue bags hold? The ones I have hold um, three gallons, I believe. 
Um, I've seen them in a couple different sizes, but these are the bigger ones. So uh, look at that if you look them up just on like Amazon or something <laughs> rather than a, a maple uh, distribution company. All right, so now let's talk about boiling, okay? What are we gonna do to cook this down? Don't do it inside. Do not start the process inside. You can finish it inside. You should finish it inside probably, but don't start it outside or inside or you're gonna peel the paint off your walls with the steam. I have literally at the nature center I worked at in Maryland, we peeled wallpaper off the wall in the old kitchen we were using while we were making syrup. Um, it's just steam, steam, steam and sticky steam too. So not something you really wanna do in your kitchen on a large scale. So if you're doing it outside, what do you do? There's a lot of ways out there. I've seen people use turkey fryers. That's one picture I don't have up here. Um, definitely seen people do that. And for finishing or getting, if you're just doing a small amount, that could work. But propane is crazy expensive right now. So I would not go with a propane based one. Um, wood fire, if you, especially if you have access to firewood, works best. So I've got four pictures on this slide that show you some different options. That top left, is my evaporator. This is what I use. I'll give you the link at the end. This is considered an inexpensive evaporator. When I bought it a few years ago, I believe it was $700. It is a steel barrel that has been modified. There's feet added to it, a door, and then the three chambered evaporator pan is the really expensive part. Um, to, to cook it down and there's a spout on the end to you just turn it and then the finished or almost finished product comes out the end, um, makes it super convenient, but that's a lot of money for a lot of people, okay? So if you're not there, you don't wanna do it yet, there's some other options. So I've pulled these pictures just off the internet of some good options. A nice big stock pot or chili pot is a good option. That top right picture, um, I'd be a little bit afraid of the way that that grill grate is sitting like unsecured on those cinder blocks. Like I'd be afraid that my whole fit, my whole pot of almost syrup would just spill. And that's very sad if that happens um, after you've gone through all this work, but it works. Cinder blocks are often used as makeshift evaporator areas. Um, below that, you'll see um, you've got a couple pots hanging over a fire, that can work too. The thing I will tell you about those methods is that your syrup is gonna have a bit of a smoky flavor. Some people don't mind that, some people even prefer it, but if you don't have a chimney directing the smoke away, like in the two pictures on the left, you will end up with a smoky taste. Um, again, personal preference, does it matter that much to you? It's not that strong of a taste but some people are picky. Um, the method on the bottom left is what I've seen a lot of people do. You've got cinder blocks and then they're using um, big sort of like catering pans. Um, it, I've seen these for sale in different places. It's like what they use in a big buffet style restaurant over a fire. And then they've got a little chimney smokestack out the back to direct the smoke away. So those are options. Any thoughts on rocket stoves was asked in the chat. I'm not familiar with that. I would have to Google what a rocket stove is to be able to answer that question, um, but I can get back to you. All right, let's keep going. Um, bottom line, an inexpensive evaporator is still gonna run you several hundred dollars to a thousand dollars. There's a couple options out there. Every once in a while you can find something used. That's always great. Um, so there are options. Now, finishing syrup, when your sap becomes syrup, how do you know and how do you do it? So first of all, like I said in the last slide, I recommend finishing indoors, okay? So you're gonna do the majority of your work outside and how long it takes depends on a lot of factors, how much surface area you have cooking, um, how hot your fire is, how cold your sap was when it went in, when you're pulling it off. There's an art and a science to this. Um, I have a bad habit of pulling my sap off too soon and then standing in my kitchen to finish way longer than I'd like to, um, but it happens quickly. But I recommend finishing indoors because you can control your temperature on the stove. 
it is a lot harder to control the temperature over an open fire. If you're on a propane, you know, if you're doing it on a grill, a turkey fry or something like that, that's, that's a different story. Um, but when you're on a wood fired thing, like what I'm using, it can happen real quick that you go from you're not there to, oh, we're there and now you've scorched your syrup. Um, I literally walked away from my pan for about 10 minutes two years ago and scorched my entire first week's worth of syrup um, and nearly ruined my pan. Um, and I will tell you that I cried real tears when that happened. So um, it's not something when you've gone through this much work, you do not want to ruin it. Um, so I bring it inside. I use a big stock pot um, to finish. And sometimes I'll even get multiple pots going um, to just increase my surface area. But how do you know? How do you know when you've hit that point? So there's a couple things you can look for. So the temperature is a big indicator. So seven and a half degrees above your boiling point for water is what you wanna look for for syrup. So this is where your candy thermometer comes in handy. So we generally say 219 degrees. You may know that boiling point of water can depend a little bit on different things. Your thermometer can read at different points, um, you know, weather, elevation, all these things can affect the boiling point of water. So test your boiling point of water with your candy thermometer first and then go seven to seven and a half degrees above that. When you hit that, your sap is now considered syrup and you can pull it off of the heat and quit boiling it. And you use a hydrometer, which is what this thing right here is. So I have a big, um, imagine like a big tube thing like this. It's a hydrometer cup that I will pour some syrup into when I think I'm getting close. And then you drop this in and it will float. And then there are lines on here. Um, and there are two different scales. There's the brick scale, the balm scale. Um, what this is, is bricks. And what you're measuring is the sugar percentage. Okay. So when it's hot, the hot reading should have us at um, 66 and a half. Is it 66 and a half? Yeah. Um, so we're trying to get our liquid here to 66 to 67% sugar. That's how much water we've taken away, okay? Um, how do we know when the water is boiling was in the chat? Yeah, bubbling, that's a good, a good rolling boil is what you wanna look for for your water. Now, in the meantime, while your syrup is, your sap is turning into syrup, it is going to boil, it's gonna bubble. Um, it can boil over, so keep an eye on that. Um, I keep mine at about a medium to medium high heat when I've got it on the stove and I'm using an electric stove and not gas. Um, when you get close, it will start to foam over um, in this like sort of um, thick brownish foam. So the next question is, how do you know when it's time to move inside? Great question. A lot of trial and error here. <laughs> this is where I've gotten it wrong many times where I often have gone in way too soon and then I'm standing in front of the stove for two hours. Um, what you look for is that foaming, okay? That's usually key for me. You can do a temperature reading outside. You know, you can try to do um, your hydrometer outside with a small sample, okay? you know, spoon it into something and then test it. Just know that your temperature is going to drop pretty quickly if you can't do it into whatever thing you're cooking in. Um, and then it also will do what we call sh is sheeting. So imagine you take a wooden spoon and you dip it into the liquid and how water would just come right off. When it's close to syrup, it will start coming off in whole sheets instead. So those are all clues that you're getting close right? When sap comes out, it looks like water. It tastes like water. When you are close to syrup, your consistency is going to get closer to syrup. Now, most of us are used to eating syrup at room temperature or cold. So when it's boiling hot, it is a lot thinner. So keep that in mind. Um, but that color, smell, taste, you know, you'll figure it out. And there, again, trial and error, but you can measure your, your temperature while you're outside and it's cooking. You can try to do a hydrometer reading outside while it's cooking and then make that call to bring it in and finish on the stove. So 
once you get to that, let's say we've measured and we're like, yes, we're finally there. We've got the, the hydrometer right where we want or the candy th thermometer is reading 219 and we're really good. We feel good. Let's take it off of the heat. You do not have to bottle right away, but I highly recommend it. Okay. So buying a filter and pre-filters is one thing that I would say do not skimp on. Okay. You could potentially take that syrup straight from the pot, pour it into a mason jar, seal it up. You do not need to go through the whole cold shop canning things like you do if you're making jellies because you're if you're working with boiling hot stuff. So that's another reason to do it while it's hot. Um, it'll suck that um, the pop thing, sorry, I don't know the right word, <laughs> on the mason jar lid straight down and it will be completely sealed um, as long as you do it while it's still hot. Um, you can use, so you could do that. You could just pour it right in. But when that happens, there is what we call maple sand that will be in your syrup. It's not going to hurt you. You can totally eat it. It's completely edible. Um, I've even heard that there's like some, you know, holistic potential benefits to it. Um, but it's getting, you're going to feel it. It's literally the minerals that are also coming out in, in this process that were in the tree. Um, so if you don't want that grainy, consistency and I'm not it's not real thick like true grains of sand but so you can feel it um, and you can sometimes see it in the bottom of a bottle if it wasn't um, filtered enough um, that's why I recommend filtering because most people prefer not to have that so you can use a cheesecloth filter um, I've seen people use like industrial big coffee filters could work they make maple syrup filters though and I'm telling you, if you're gonna spend money on one thing, buy that, like buy it. You can reuse them over and over. So um, what you see in the bigger picture on this slide is my super fancy approach to using a filter. And that's a pretty large filter. I started with a much smaller one that's like this. It was 12 inches. This one is like 24 inches or so, hung it across with a piece of wood and you pour the sap or pour the syrup into the top of it and let it drain through that cone. There are things called pre-filters that are thin um, that they go through first. And as the flow slows down, you pull out a pre-filter and it'll have all that sediment in it, right? That you don't want in your bottle. And then it'll keep flowing faster and faster. And you can wash and reuse these. Um, if you are handy with a sewing machine, you could definitely make yourself a filter. If you find nice tight wool, that's what this is made out of and make your own filter, totally would work. Um, you can use cheesecloth, it's not the most ideal, um, but go for it if you have no other options. Something is better than nothing. Um, when you're bottling, make sure that your glass containers are sterile. Um, maple syrup does not go bad, but what can happen is if you bottle into something that had bacteria sitting in it because it was not sterilized first, then you could get bacteria growth. And maple syrup is mostly just sugar and who loves sugar? Bacteria. So that's how you get um, some nasty stuff growing in your syrup bottles. So um, with that, to sterilize the bottles, I, just, I put them into boiling water for several minutes and then pull them out, let them dry, and then bottle that. And I, I'm usually doing that at the same time as I'm finishing. So I know they're sterile. So I sterilize them as I'm finishing and then I've got them ready to go. Um, and then you pour it into your bottles, jars, whatever it is you're using um, and do it again while they're still hot and it will seal up and it'll be totally good. Um, the last note on this slide is I say, use a grading kit if you want to. Syrup is graded in different ways. Vermont, it used to be that the fanciest one was called Vermont Fancy, and then there was grade A, and it would go down from there. So here's what it is. So the first batch of syrup you pull out at the beginning of the year, I'm going to use this because this is from a grading kit, is going to be um, very, very light in color. And even in that picture on the lower left, you can see the different colors, right? So um, and this is actually that very grading kit. So the highest quality syrup, okay, comes out earliest in the season. Excuse me, as your season goes on, naturally occurring bacteria in the tree, around the tree will show up and these impurities will get in and it changes the flavor of your syrup a little bit. 
And does it make your syrup bad? No, not at all. In fact, some people prefer the darker syrup. So here is one of my first batches of syrup from last year. Here is one of my last batches of syrup from last year. So you can see the difference in these two, right? They get darker. The flavor difference is that those earlier higher grades are going to have just a sweetness with less of that distinct rich maple flavor. As you go through the season and your syrup darkens, your syrup is going to get more of that robust maple flavor. So that's why I mean that not some people don't even want that. I actually prefer the later, more robust maple flavor because I like the flavor of maple syrup. If you're just looking for a sweetener, but you're not crazy about maple, then you like the other stuff better. So it's a personal preference thing. Either way, it doesn't matter. One thing I will tell you is that if you like start and stop your boiling, like I'm going to boil a little bit today, but I can't finish. And then, so I'm going to let it cool down and then heat it back up tomorrow and maybe add some more sap. You're going to get darker syrup. Okay, um, that's just because you're mixing different things, you're letting it cool, giving more time for bacteria, not necessarily, not bacteria that's going to hurt you or anything, but just bacteria to grow and things to change the flavors um, as you go. So that's just a bit on grading. Um, you got it bottled up, you know, you can buy the fancy bottles, you can use mason jars, they make great gifts. Maple syrup is a fantastic gift that is easy to impress people with. And then pop it on your pancakes, your eggs, your ice cream, uh, hot maple syrup on vanilla ice cream, fresh is amazing. Um, and then you enjoy it, okay? So that was like a massive information dump in a short amount of time. Um, I'm gonna end with just this slide up of maple resources where to look for more information, where you can order things. I'll run through them real quick and then I'm gonna open it up for questions. So local resources, we have an Indiana Maple Syrup Association. This is our professional organization here in Indiana. You can be a member for like $15 a year, $20 a year maybe. Um, definitely a great um, resource to get answers to questions. They hold a conference every year in December. Their location changes throughout the state, but there's always vendors there people to talk to. Um, so especially if you're thinking about maybe doing this on a larger scale, great resource to go to. The conference is cool, great place to get supplies. Um, the Indiana Maple Syrup Producers Facebook group is something I started a few years ago. I've added a couple other administrators over the last year, um, which I really appreciate. Um, I, there's not a link on there. You'll have to just search it because it's a private group. But if you search Indiana Maple Syrup Producers, on Facebook, you will find it, request to join. You're gonna be asked like, where in Indiana do you live? Um, and then you can join the group. And it is an incredible forum of other local people who can answer questions. And it runs from backyard producers who are maybe doing it for the first time, just tapping one or two trees to the bigger producers. Um, there are some vendors on there that sell supplies some people who sell some used supplies. So highly recommend if you're giving this a shot to join that group. Um, closer by Harris Sugarbush is in Greencastle. So not too far from central Indiana, from the Indy area. Um, they make a decent amount of syrup every year and they sell some supplies. I did not touch base with them before this to see what they have in stock or what they have, but somebody to reach out to pretty close. Um, Agrarian has in the past carried some maple sugaring supplies during the season, usually limited, um, but if you want somewhere to look, um, I'd give them a call and see what they have in stock. And then a couple other Northern Indiana suppliers if you're looking for things like evaporators or evaporator pans. Um, other places to order equipment, um, I order from Bascom every year. Um, <clears throat> they're out of New Hampshire. They're awesome. Shipping is usually quick. That's all they do is maple syrup stuff. All, that's all they do. Okay. Um, I like supporting them. They've been wonderful to me. Tap My Trees is an online supplier for hobby sugar makers. So usually you're smaller um, producers and they will sell little kits that come with like five buckets, things like that, um, that you, you know, you could use. So that's a great starter place. Leader Evaporator is like 
the evaporator maker. They make everything from smaller backyard ones to the massive large scale ones. Vermont Evaporator Company is the company that I bought from. They are a small business out of Vermont that just takes these steel barrels and turns them into evaporators and they're awesome. And just to plug them, I wish I was like sponsored or got something from them, but I don't. Um, but they, they're they awesome because their evaporators can also convert into like a wood fire grill. My evaporator has, I can take the pan out and put grill grates on it for a wood fire grill. And the newer ones have a lid to use it as a smoker at the same time too, or not at the same time, but like in the off season. So if you're thinking about buying a smoker and you're thinking about buying an evaporator, there you go, two, two birds, one stone. Um, so I'll leave this up while I answer questions. If you wanna screenshot it, write some of these down. And again, I'm gonna send this all out um, so you guys can have this info. But those are just some of my recommendations. Again, by far not the only places to look. You can even buy some of the stuff on Amazon. Um, I have at times, especially if I'm in a hurry, but I try to support directly to these, um, these distributors if I can. So um, I've got a couple of people that have asked some questions. Um, um, so let me get through these. If you reheat the maple syrup when you use it, will it convert to maple sugar if you heat it multiple times? So good question. So maple sugar is what you get if you remember we said we were at 67, 66, 67% sugar when we're at this point. If you keep going, you can get down to maple sugar. Um, and people make amazing maple sugar candy. I have never tried it. You can do it. I have um, gotten it down to that point before, just sort of on one pan for a demo before. It happens very quickly um, and it can be very easy to scorch it, but yes, you can get it down to that. Um, but it you would know if you were getting to that point. Um, have we ever tapped walnut trees? I have not on my own home property because I don't have any walnut trees here. However, at um, my former workplace, we did tap black walnuts because we had some it's totally doable. Black walnut syrup is really tasty, especially if you like a more nutty flavor. Um, it's gonna be thicker, it's gonna be darker, almost a more molassesy kind of consistency. What I can't give you right now is um, your like hydrometer or candy thermometer readings or how you would know exactly when to start stop, but the rest of the process is exactly the same. Exactly the same. Tap, collect, they will not produce as much sap. As a, um, as a sugar maple though. So um, another question, if your trees stop producing, do you ever re-trill the holes? So that's a good question. And the answer is usually not. So sometimes what will happen is you notice, usually what just happens is your tree doesn't produce. Okay, and that's when you might re-drill a hole. Like, man, for whatever reason, this is not a good spot or maybe I put the tap in too far. Um, I have at that time redrilled the hole again, make sure you're going a ways away from it, you know, at least 12 inches away. Um, the two inches up or down away was for a healed hole from last year. If you're adding another hole, it needs to be at least 12 inches away um, and give it a try. Every once in a while, for whatever reason, you find a tree that's sort of a dud. Um, it can happen. Um, if your tree, your trees generally won't be like doing great and then just dry up for no reason. Usually you're getting to the end of the season if you're seeing that. Um, I have never tried to make maple butter. That was another, another question here. I've had some really tasty maple creams. I mean, people go all out with the maple products. I stick just to syrup, um, <laughs> but there are some great recipes out there if you want to dive in any further. So with that, if anybody has any other questions, throw them in the chat or unmute yourself if you if you wanna um, share your voice. Um, if you think of any other questions, especially as you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know. I just, I found my tree, I'm not sure. Email me, you all have my email address. Everybody that's watching this live, um, if you end up watching this later, comment and I can reach out. Um, I wanna be a, a resource to you. Um, if start following the Indiana Maple Syrup Association on their social media pages. Um, the first weekend of March, there's usually the Indiana Maple Weekend where a lot of smaller home producers will actually open their property and invite people over to come see their process. Um, and they're, they're usually not like, you know, just the 
five tree backyard people, but those who are doing a decent amount, but maybe not large scale. Um, and um, I don't participate in that just because I don't have the space. Um, but those are some things to think about um, that you could go check out. How long does it typically take for a tree to become large enough to tap? It depends on the species of tree. Um, silver maples grow pretty fast. You could have probably a 10 year old silver maple that can hit that. If you've got uh, sugar maples, you're gonna get closer to 10 to 15 years. So um, it depends on the type of maple tree, but they can't be a little saplings. We're looking for at least 10 inches apart. Um, for those of you who are local to Zionsville, um, we are gonna do a maple magic public program to show people the process and teach kids about tapping trees on February 5th. So you can register for that on our website if you'd like to see it. We're just gonna tap like one or two trees and, and show people the general process. At this point, we're not doing it at any kind of large scale in the Zionsville parks. Um, I know Hendricks County Parks does um, maple syrup weekends usually in February maybe the first week of March. I don't know what they have on their calendar for it this year yet, um, but there are plenty of places. Hamilton County has some where you can go see all of this in progress, but right now is the time of year to be stocking up on your supplies, making your plans if you are intending to tap. So I appreciate everybody tuning in tonight and I hope you learned a few things. I hope you're not too terribly uh, intimidated uh, to start the process. And if you have questions, let me be a resource for you as well as all those other resources I listed. I'll send out the recording link tomorrow. So you can always go back and see if there's anything else that you missed. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Um, go Hoosiers. Sorry, boiler makers. Take care, guys.